Hello, my name is Christopher Levels, and I'm the Vice President of Development, and I'm going to be talking about uh, GitLab and my first two years at GitLab. I started on January 22nd, uh, 2019, so I'm just coming up on two years, and I, I say at home because GitLab is a work-at-home company, um, and I couldn't really come up with a better title, so that was kind of what I chose. So. What I'd like to cover is just uh, a few things. Uh, there are a couple of topics I didn't get to, but you know, some interesting experiences that others might not have uh, had at their companies. Uh, in particular, we have grown uh, extremely fast in the last year and at a pretty high volume. So we wanted to talk a little bit about that and opportunities, as well as uh, our KPIs and how we're thinking about them and how we developed them over the past couple of years and uh, organization structure and just kind of thinking about that because we have kind of an unusual organizational structure. And last but not least, everybody's favorite talk, topic when you talk to GitLab is uh, COVID-19 and all the impacts around work from home and how we have adapted to it. So as far as hiring goes, I uh, got a lot of words on this page, but uh, kind of wanted to just talk about uh, what we think about in terms of the growth that we've had and kind of how we went about it. Uh, in particular, uh, when I started on uh, January 22nd, uh, one of the key things that came up was is that I was going to be interviewing pretty much daily. Uh, I had the highest number of interviews, I think, for the first six months I was in the team. And uh, in the second half of the year, I think that was I was second only to one of my direct reports uh, in the company. So it's been a really aggressive period of time, you know, working roughly 50 percent of the 50 percent of the time on that activity. Uh, in particular, we had a really strong strategy associated with our, our aspects of it, and we also had a pretty strong plan about how we would go about uh, um, uh, hiring folks. And I really want to emphasize that that's if you're thinking about hiring, say, more than three people a month, uh, these are the kinds of things I would think about and being systematic about it. Um, key to this was uh, being because we're a trans extremely transparent company, we were giving people lots of opportunities to see what we were about ahead of time uh, through handbooks our handbook and uh, also being able to see our code base because it's open source as well as public notes and videos. I know a lot of companies don't have this type of uh, transparency. That's okay. Just think about in terms of how you want to advertise and make sure people kind of are aware of what your company is about and they're doing. Uh, another thing I'd like to highlight is uh, making sure that you have your criteria really well established uh, to make sure that you're getting quality hires. So that's another key aspect that we really focused on through this process and, our, and in particular in our strategy associated with it. And then uh, last but not least, I just want to kind of cover as far as strategy goes, our focus on uh, candidate experience. Uh, in particular, GitLab is an async company. What that means is a lot of times you'll work, be working on something, you'll submit it, and then you might not get feedback for 24 or 48 hours. Our interview process kind of similarly designed. Uh, that doesn't necessarily translate well to all companies, but that's one of the things you want to think about in these particular situations is like, are you expecting to try to get through all the interviews in one day as an example for the candidate? That's a good candidate experience, but that doesn't necessarily always translate to a company and how a company actually runs associated with that. The other aspect is thinking about how can you expose them to the tooling and other pieces that you actually have in your company and those aspects. As far as the plan goes, uh, it was pretty standard. Uh, there wasn't necessarily uh, much that we deviated from what I would say normal engineering aspects of it. Uh, one particular aspect that I would say that we really focused on was uh, retroing it through the process. And that really gave us some good feedback loops to both catch uh, individual kind of challenges as well as also catch uh, some process related challenges. And uh, that's that's probably the biggest thing I would say is just come up with the, that original plan and then continue to iterate on it and make it better as you kind of go along. Uh, for KPIs, I know a number of folks have been working on key performance indicators and uh, we're all metrics driven companies. I, I just want to kind of give you kind of our take on it and kind of what we've done. Uh, one of the key aspects I see is, is that to make sure your values line up with your actual KPIs. It's really interesting. You see a lot of companies that talk about, oh, well, we really want to get things out to the market fast but they don't talk about what the trade-offs they're willing to make either in quality or in pay um, or cost associated with that. And that's key to kind of a lot of things that we do. Uh, in particular, we view highly iteration. So we focus a lot on doing ver things very small and very quickly. Um, and you kind of see that as you kind of look through our KPIs as well. 
Um, other th aspects that we did is, is don't have your KPIs separated all over the place. Make sure that you have kind of a one-stop shop that you can go to. Because we have the handbook capabilities, we basically have them all in there. And if uh, I share this document with folks, they can see you click, start clicking on this link, so you'll actually start seeing uh, places that you can go to actually see that. So uh, as an example, this is the one for the engineering team overall, where it kind of lists out at a high level our OKRs associated with it. So it's pretty cool from that perspective. And you can see different, different types of investments we've made from that perspective. Uh, next thing to note is, is we definitely started with the definition of our KPIs, but we would iterate on them and change the definition if we felt we needed to based on learnings or needs. Uh, we'd pick a cadence for review uh, once a month to basically kind of go through them and be transparent in our assessments. Um, we'd also try to make sure that they have the look and the feel. If I go back to the previous slide, what you'll see is, is a lot of these sites are very similar in regards to the fact of of showing month to month what's going on and then thinking of it in terms of rates uh, associated with that, uh, which I'll cover kind of in the next slide as well. And then, um, uh, you know, focus on trends. Uh, a lot of times what you'll see with metrics is getting to, uh, particularly with KPIs, you'll see people focus on exact numbers. I, I tend to not coach the team in that fashion. What I tend to coach on is improvement and seeing uh, trends and also understanding what's going on and be able to explain it. So I think that's a, another aspect that is important and kind of differentiates us a little bit uh, from other teams potentially. And then be able to slice and dice your information uh, down to the team level. We view our metrics as a team sport and uh, really encourage that. We don't want them to be viewed as individual uh, metrics because that can oftentimes be uh, gamified negatively and we want to gam gamify positively. So that's one thing that we kind of think about in our cases. Uh, one, being able to slice and dice it down to teams, but then that not really slice and dice it more. And down below, I've listed kind of our, our top level ones, uh, which uh, from a development perspective are there. This slide is just kind of a quick, kind of shows that look and feel associated with it. This is uh, every month I do, or every other month I do a group conversation where I kind of present to the overall uh, company, kind of what's going on in development and the different aspects. And this kind of shows like how I would report out and associate with it along with different information that we kind of provide around it. So example is, is uh, October was a slower month for us in our MR rate, which is our number of MRs actually committed and then divided by the number of actual engineers in the development organization. Uh, so it's a rate-based metric, uh, not the overall number associated with it because we're focused on efficiency. Um, here you see different aspects that I've been looking at uh, from that perspective. Next up, uh, this is really, I've struggled with how to basically present a slide or a picture of how different uh, um, uh, GitLab's uh, development organization is from other companies' development organizations. In particular, what we decided to do in early 2019 is actually map directly to, uh, to our product offering. So wherever you see a DevSecOps uh, stage in our product, what you'll see is actually a team or actually set of teams are basically built around that. And uh, both product management as well as, as development engineers are both front end and back end associated with it. So we established a one-to-one -one peer relationship as best we could between the two organizations, though uh, in the middle layers, it gets a little bit more confusing associated with it. And we kind of focused on that uh, aspect. Um, uh, when I coming into this job, I kind of worried that we didn't have like an architectural team or, or aspect of it. Originally, when I put these slides together, I said, don't, um, it hasn't broken us yet. And uh, of course, you know, bad luck says don't do that and say those statements. But um, so far, we've been able to do it. Um, but one thing that we have been able to do is, is do have some infrastructure teams around uh, different parts of our product. And the key aspect that I'd encourage other people to think about is, is when you have those types of teams is to still have product management support for those teams. Uh, it's a little bit different. It's a little product management teams may look at you a little funny when you ask for it, but uh, having somebody look at that is uh, important from that perspective. So, so I encourage teams to think about that uh, aspect um, uh, from there. And then uh, last but not least, uh, COVID-19, everybody likes to talk about us and say, you all work from home, so COVID-19 didn't affect you all, right? But it actually turns out that, you know, people still had lives. So a number of our employees were going to co-working spaces. That obviously had to change as kind of shutdowns happened. And then all the standard things that happen in life, uh, uh, you know, children, marriages, even uh, some people still getting robbed and, and just general stress associated with it. We did have that business impact and concerns. So that also caused us to adjust and adapt much like other companies did. 
Um, we also had our, a lot of our time taken away uh, to basically help other teams think about work from home and also look at tool their tooling to kind of talk about it. And then even though the sales team is kind of a work from home, uh, a lot of companies, reality is, is that they still have a lot of face-to-face -face time and we lost that uh, during this impact. So, um, uh, you know, what really helped us as a company was it was, you know, we hired the people who were used to this, so it, it definitely didn't adjust as much. Uh, obviously, GitLab's tooling is a key aspect here. And then, um, you know, we had developed this async model, uh, which if you're thinking about changing your organization, uh, just understand that if you're going to go to an async model, it does lead to uh, potentially more things getting done. But it does mean that your team has to be able to be able to multitask a lot. And also they have to they have to be able to be um, uh, patient because they don't necessarily have that feedback cycle, that immediate feedback cycle associated with it. And if your management team isn't really uh, set up for that type of thing, then it's going to be challenging associated with it. So I know that was a really quick talk and lots of words on the page, but uh, I just figured I'd give uh, 10 minutes to kind of talk about that. And then I want to see if uh, folks had questions or uh, different aspects that they wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Nishan, just speak up. Yeah, I just had one one question regarding the product manager for your for your infrastructure teams that was interesting could you like expound on that like yeah what's the, what's the reasoning and how does that work out play out yeah it's 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 um it's it's an interesting um dynamic which is uh 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 Basically, uh, for a long time, uh, our product has been largely driven by our CEO and co-founder. Um, and one of the things is he's a very uh, product-oriented individual. And uh, he really likes, he, he does like, I don't know if I, I'm trying to think how to say this. I don't know if the next company I would encourage this necessarily is like a like this level of it. But he he's a strong believer in 100% prioritization by the, um, by the product management team. So like, it's an example, we don't, we don't, have an 80-20 rule. We don't fix bugs as part of it. And his reasoning is he wants to see good argumentation and our debate associated with it. So the philosophy is, is you know, debate these things heavily and then determine what. Um, what I found is, is that uh, having a product manager who's at least aware of the challenges that are facing a team architecturally is super important. And if you only do it, like say once a quarter, it's not the same as actually having somebody on the team who's focusing on a day-to-day -day who then is arguing associated with it. So it's unusual. It, it is a little less like uh, front and center, but it, it does allow uh, for uh, people to argue about things that need to be done for the product in a more effective way, uh, uh, in my opinion. So does that help? Or are you looking for something? No, I, I think that's helpful. I mean, I, I think uh, many times the, the issue that we've always had is trying to prioritize infrastructure stuff. And it's very hard to get that um, as part of the priority roadmap. And um, this is just an interesting way of, of dealing with it because you're really pulling product back into the into the conversation. And so I, I just, I've never, I've never heard yeah, of this approach. So. This is the way I would put it is uh, engineering arguments are usually very good at being engineering arguments. And they're not good at being product decisions, right? So like uh, by taking somebody who has that skill set uh, from a product focus to be able to make that same argument, uh, you actually put yourself in a much stronger position to basically argue for those things. And then the other part is if you have a, a backlog, say for instance, the team is working against it, like they're, if they own that prioritization, that backlog, then they're gonna make sure that the right things are getting prioritized uh, from that perspective. So so it also gives the team comfort that there isn't like, say for instance, a, 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 um, a team that's, you know, like nobody knows what they're doing, so to speak, uh, from that perspective. Cool. Other questions? You, you mentioned uh, that at first you were a little concerned that they didn't have a dedicated architecture team that's how i interpret it anyway so uh -huh. how does architecture get done at, at github or gitlab excuse me yeah, gitlab uh don't 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 talk, talk about the competitors uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, so uh this is something that's been involving uh, what happened generally speaking is uh, because we're an open source project uh, a lot of open source projects like they say we don't believe in architecture we believe in code running code uh, you know, maybe even running code in rough consensus. Uh, we actually just started a blueprint process, uh, which is very common in the open source community, where uh, basically we're having a lot of our, our senior engineers uh, basically put proposals forward. Uh, we're not doing it for everything uh, because 
because of this high level of iteration, oftentimes like we're not as focused there. So, so we are implementing something uh, that we just did in like the last quarter where we're, we're, we're kind of focused on, okay, what are the architectural initiatives? Generally what we do is we have this concept of working groups as well that we started in the past two years where we basically bring a team of folks together to work on a problem. And that's oftentimes how we would address architectural challenges is to basically get that team together, work with me and uh, have a well-defined set of exit criteria and get it to a point where it was like more of our continuous process associated with it. So, but uh, that's, that's one of the challenges actually I'm trying to surface more of is, is like, okay, how do we want to do things and how do we want things to work as well uh, kind of moving forward. So uh, I have a question real quick, um, Christopher. So in, in, in some of my experiences, I've noticed that companies who put a, a heavy focus, especially um, on product driven development, they tend to be slower in innovation because essentially they're reacting to what customers will be looking for, which is obviously good, right? That drives revenue. But how do you all prioritize innovation, like creating new things in the company? And, and obviously, you know, if, you, if we put in, uh, architecture aside, what else do you all build? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So, uh, you know, our product is a DevSecOps integration model, right? Based on Git, right? So um, uh, what we found is, is that we've largely, uh, in the short term, what we found is, is that uh, we've got pretty much the, the core set of functionality. And it's been about around smaller innovations around those parts of the product associated with it. Um, uh, to answer your question, one of the things we are thinking about is other areas that we want to move into. And we've actually started this concept of singleton category. And if you actually go out to get labs page and look at our product categories page, you'll see this where we actually define these other areas. We call them, originally we called them uh, moonshots. That's a little bit too strong of a term for this because we're starting with just like maybe one engineer working on these and really trying to see if we gain, gain interest. Out. So that's, that's kind of our innovation path from that perspective. I would argue that we're actually still as a product team uh, still doing a lot of innovation. It's just incremental innovations where you know, small improvements. We have a week, a monthly cadence to our product where we basically release once a month. Uh, though we're also continuously updating our uh, our dot com site as well. So uh, you know we're doing constant changes there where we're basically seeing uh, seeing things. And I, I also view that as innovation as well associated with that based on both feedback from customers as well as other pieces. So. I think that's one aspect that um, I, I, maybe I choose to assume this and maybe it's not a good assumption, which is uh, release your product frequently and often and then get feedback and adjust um, from that perspective. I have, I have a question, Ooh. it's not too late. Um, I'm, uh, I'm wondering how, since GitLab is a global company and you do have a lot of people from outside of the United States, right? Um, you have a lot of engineers outside of the United States as well. I'm wondering how historically, and I wonder if it changed over time, had the, um, you had the compensation um, structure um, uh, built up for, for engineers in different locations in different countries and so on. And, and whether uh, certain countries in certain locations have kind of full-time roles with all benefits versus certain locations that only have kind of contract uh, situation. Yeah, we have a whole team that's actually around our compensation structure. Um, basically, you know, we're 1200 strong now, or actually probably a little bit slightly a lot larger than that. Um, and uh, we have a, a team that focuses around that. Um, there's two different aspects to that. One is, is if you're going into a country where you say have below a certain threshold, you can usually employ them through contracting. But we still look at the market rates that are in that current country and that's how we offer competitive salaries is basically at their market rates associated with it. Um, so we're, we're a market rate company, um, not a cost of living company, um, not a single uh, salary range company as well. Um, and that's that's kind of our focus. So far it's worked pretty well for us, but we have seen uh, places where certain areas of the world we cannot necessarily employ as easily as others as an example. Um, and then certain uh, countries that just have really um, prohibitive uh, employment, employment uh, restrictions that really make it difficult for us. Once we get above a certain size, we we basically go into an entity, a situation, and then you know we basically convert folks to the basically rather than being on a contractor status. That's why we use the term a team member uh, rather than employee because that of the differentiation between whether they're contracting 
uh, because of where they live geography wise or whether they're actually technical uh, employed by the entity uh, from that perspective. But they're all team members from our perspective as well as our community contribution members. And so far it's worked pretty well. I would say though uh, going country by country, they're definitely challenging hotspots associated with it. And then a conversion is always a challenge when you go from say contracting to an entity because of different considerations around that. And it kind of varies from country to country. So as, as a, thank you, as a, as a follow-up question to that, given that a lot of people are in different geographical locations, how do you structure your teams? Um, yeah, really good question. Um, we actually don't structure by time zone. So in some cases we've seen uh, teams where uh, uh, they're completely dispersed. Uh, we've also had situations where uh, most of the team is in one region and as an example, the manager's in another region. Uh, that's where the async communication is kind of key from that perspective. We usually like to see some overlap, like maybe two hours, but like relative to most companies that would say, for instance, want a six hour working model, we're, we're in the category of we're more than willing to have people work across. And then what we try to focus in on is if it's not working for somebody, we try to figure out what's going on and we kind of do it. As an example, one team, they recognize that uh, half the team was geographic in one location and the other half was in the other location. So because of that, they actually didn't allow uh, Zoom calls unless they were all involved, which meant that they had to basically um, only had really a very tight window to work uh, that. But that, that was kind of like you lower the bar, which may affect in the short term your efficiency, you lower the bar uh, for everybody. Uh, so then consequently, everybody's involved. So there's not uh, people feeling left out uh, from that perspective, which is a key aspect is, is uh, if you're going to be in a hybrid model, which is the you know, half team that works in an office and the other half work remotely, you're you're going to be in a non-optimal situation uh, from that perspective. Thanks, Thank everybody. you so much, Christopher. That was awesome.